I just want to read a scripture to begin with from the book of 1 John, one that you're familiar with. And John was uh, encouraging the saints, and he said, Do not love the world. This is 1 John chapter 2, beginning verse 15, or anything in the world. When he talks about the world, he's not talking about the planet Earth. He's talking about how the governing of human affairs and things that are happening in our culture. And uh, he's talking about how the world is simply alienated and turned away from God. And that was true back when John penned these words. It's so true today. The world, this depraved culture, is in complete opposition towards God. We see that so clearly with the horrific things that are taking place in our nation and this world we live in. We see where people are saying that which is good is evil and that which is evil is good, getting things all messed up and upside down. And so John says, be careful that you don't fall in love with the world and the things of the world. All its forms of advertisement and uh, propping the idea how the world is so wonderful and all these things. And he says, if anyone has a passion and love for the world, he goes on to say, the love of God the Father is not within you. For everything in the world, and he identifies the craving of sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. And trust that that is true and a reality in our lives and each and every one of, of our lives here. What's happened recently, as you well know, a couple of weeks ago in Buffalo, New York, a young man who was ra ra radicalized, indoctrinated through the Internet, a white supremacist, and travels from Conklin, New York, which is just about southeast of Binghamton, New York, travels all the way to Buffalo, New York, and purposely focuses on, on African-American people at a grocery store called Tops, and doesn't know these people, goes into that grocery store and opens fire and execute murders 10 people. Then shortly after that, as you well know, you saw in the news, Yaldi, Texas, where an 18-year-old man legally buys two assault weapons, and uh, who knows what was going on in his mind, and the only thing I can say, that's definitely a manifestation of the evil, and uh, just full of the adversary, Satan, that traveled to a place, goes into an elementary school, kills two teachers and 19 children, and it just does this horrific crime. And you're trying to say, why, what in the world inspires or causes a young man to do something like that? Shoots his grandmother in the face. And and I don't, it, it troubled me, and I know it troubled you when you watch the news and as it's revealing what has happened and, and taken place. And you might ask the question, I, and I think many people lie, why, why did this type of tragedy happen over and over again? Where you see Columbine and when you see what's happened in Florida and different places. And you, you think about that. You think an elementary school had two days of school left. Young children, 9, 10, 11 years of age, looking forward to getting out of school and doing their summer activities. And all of a sudden, boom, their life is gone and wasted. And I'm think, I think about what's happening and, and you hear what, the legislators want to do, pass more gun laws. And uh, I think 
those things are important, significant. You don't want an assault wipe, a weapon placed in the hand of an, a person who is deranged and who's a psychopath. And not that we're out there trying to pinpoint people or take their civil rights away and, and how we can somehow bring some civilization, some godliness around these things. And it seems more prevalent here in the United States than in some other countries in the world. Not saying that that hasn't happened other places. It has. It's impossible to correct everything and prevent everything from happening, such as we see happen this past week. Now, here's my take on it. As I prayed and thought about that, the last statement in my introduction, I say this, our culture I believe, has become a breeding ground for the insanity that took place at Robb Elementary School. There's something tremendously wrong going on in this world we live in, this culture we live in. And as I thought about these things, and I want to have understanding and pray, and, and I heard people say on the news media, well, what good does prayer do? And you can't blame the world for having that understanding. We know the power of prayer. We have no idea how many times through the power of prayer things have been stopped or avoided. I know in my life, I'm sure in your life, when you have maybe driven down the road or been here or there, that you can't prove it, but you know deep in your heart and mind that God protected you, his guardian angels were around you, that you did not lose your life. However, there are good godly people who suffer, and bad things happen to good people, and people do lose their lives. What, a couple weeks ago, a young girl who was in our church growing up, and I think her current age right now was 26 years of age. She graduated from KSU and was engaged to get married, was skydiving, jumped out of the airplane, and her parachute didn't open. Her safety chute didn't open, and she fell to her death. And a lot of times people who don't understand God and his grace and mercy and how things happen, they'll ask the question, why didn't God stop that? And people do make choices. And there are certain laws of nature, such as gravity. And if you, as a good godly person, are driving a vehicle and you violate certain natural laws because there's a slick road or you try to come into the curve of a highway at too high a rate of speed, more likely you'll go off the road. That's happened to me twice in my foolish days. I remember I was on a motorcycle. I was doing about 80 miles an hour, and all of a sudden I came to this curve, and I leaned and leaned and leaned and went off the highway. Fortunately, there were construction. There was no guardrail there. Went down in the ravine held on and came out. I stopped and I said, thank you, Jesus. One time I was driving my wonderful, beautiful vehicle I acquired for $100 in 1966, a 1951 green, ugly green Studebaker. The doors open like this. And uh, to stop it, you had to pump the brakes and hit the emergency brake. And um, me and a buddy of mine were in skinny Atlas, New York. I was in the military. And um, the laws of nature, such as gravity and centrifugal force and all these other things, didn't apply to me. I was above that. And at nighttime, we're, I come around this corner... At a high rate of speed, 35 miles an hour. <laughs> no, a little bit faster than that. And when I came around that corner, all of a sudden there's a stop sign. 
And he had to go left or right. It was too late to go left or right. So the Dukes of Hazard. I could have been on that TV show. Flew off that highway into the air. And me and my buddy ended up in a swamp. Sold that car to the local farmer for $5. And we hitchhiked the rest of the way. So I have to say, you know, uh, that God definitely protected me. And I want to say something. I know that something like that, maybe not exactly, has happened to your life. And you're here and alive today because somehow you can't prove it. You have no empirical evidence, but you know for a fact that God spared your life. Amen? And so we look at uh, things that are happening in our world today. God puts certain things in motion. His common grace protects us and protects a lot of people who don't even know Jesus. If God totally takes his hand off our nation, off our lives, because of the depravity of human nature, because of this world that is completely in opposition, alienated from God, we would not survive very long. Something holds things in order. In the book of Colossians, it talks about the consistency of Christ Jesus, how he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily and keeps everything together. Even down to the smallest thing as a single atom has opposing forces, yet it stays together. However, this world we live in, God says, don't fall in love with the world or the things of the world. The world is under the control of the adversary, Satan, who is in complete opposition against the things of God. And John clearly says, he says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, those things are so clear, so evident in this world we live in. And so I'm thinking about what's happened in Buffalo, I'm thinking what's happened in Texas, and begin to realize I'm four contributing factors to the depravity of our culture, how we can have some understanding and how we can pray. Amen? First, as I already mentioned, our nation has alienated itself from God by turning away from him. In the book of Judges, it talks about a cycle going on. These are God's chosen people, but they weren't like this to God. Much like what's happened here in America. We say, God, stay at our schools. We don't want to pray in the morning for your blessing protection. We don't want to lead our children in elementary school middle school, high school. Father, we ask God, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Protect us. Watch over us, Lord. No. We, don't, we, we are afraid that we're going to infringe upon someone's civil liberties, so let's not pray. And then at times, let's have a, a moment of silence. I wonder in a moment of silence how many people really call out to God or they just say, we're like, hurry and get this thing we're with, over with so we can get on with the ball game. Is that really what's happening in the minds of people? And so if you take God out of the lives of people as a nation, you pass ridiculous laws that say no to God. That happened in Israel. And when God would bring judgment, not to destroy them, but to bring them to a place of repentance, they would repent, turn to God, and then they'd fall back in that old cycle. I remember, remember 9-11? On national news, I heard ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, different ones, calling people to pray. And then people were sober-minded, praying for about two weeks, and then back to their lives and sin as being normal. In the book of Judges, the last verse in chapter 21, verse 5 says, In those days in Israel, 
what happened was, they said, we have no king. Especially God is not our king. He's not the preeminent one in our lives. And it says, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. And we see history being repeated again. We have essentially said, God, stay out of our schools. Stay out of our lives. Lord, we don't need your help when it comes to conducting business. We, Lord, say, God, leave us alone because we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we can make it happen. That's pride. That's arrogance. In the book of Proverbs chapter 6, it says, there are six things God hates, yea, seven. One of them is pride or arrogance, sowing discord, the shedding of innocent blood. And a lot of those things that God hates we, as a culture, this nation we live in, are adhering to that. In 1973, our nation legalized abortion. Essentially what abortion is, when you look in the Bible, you won't see the word abortion, but from Genesis to Revelation, it talks about how God detests and hates the shedding of innocent blood. And so... The repercussion, the consequence of making this legal, I believe, has devalued the belief of the sanctity of life. Think about it. I know the argument for abortion is a woman's rights. When you come to Jesus... And you make him not only your savior, but the master of your life. What you do, essentially, in adhering to the gospel, you forfeit your life. And you put your life under the Lord Jesus Christ, who becomes preeminent in your life. You become a new creation. You begin to be repentant and forgiving, yielding and turning to God, and you say, Lord, you be first in my life. Well, how can God be first in your life? If you're going to be a follower and disciple of Jesus, one of the characteristics of being Christ-like is you prefer others over yourself. Joy, Jesus first, others second, you last. And that pertains to every single person, male or female, young or old, rich or poor. And when a baby is conceived in the womb of that woman, that becomes a person who's separate and distinct from her. And what God says, will you be willing to inconvenience yourself for nine months to give that unborn child life? And I think my understanding that a lot of women who have had abortion later realize, what have I done? And when that happens, if you will call out to Jesus, he will heal you and restore you. Sin is sin. There's no sin that is a small sin or a great sin. sin. Sin is separation and isolation from God and essentially doing what I want to oppose what God wants. And so, when you get in the mindset of something that's been going on for decades in our nation where we say, you know, this is just not a human being. This is just a piece of flesh. It's not, the conscience hasn't developed, not fully developed, but it is something that God miraculously brings about, the seed of life between the male and female and Life begins. And if we can just discard that and go against the idea that every person is born in the image of God, we begin to devalue the importance and sanctity of life that begins to pervade into the hearts and minds of people, both male and female, no matter what country you live in. And that does something intrinsically in the heart and mind of a person 
if we can do that, which God says, this is wrong. And so we position ourselves, become a breeding ground for this insanity where we devalue human life at the beginning of that life. Evilness that we see that was so well portrayed and demonstrated this manifestation of evil in Texas, also in New York just recently. The problem is not in a gun or a knife or a club or a vehicle. The problem we have in America, in particular where we live, is found right here in the heart of man. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, The heart of man is deceitful and evil above all things. Who can really know the heart of a man? Now, I think we need to have background checks when a person purchases a gun, a pistol, or a rifle, or, a, or whatever. You need to have background checks. You need maybe even do away with salt weapons. I don't need an AR-15 to deer hunt. I use a bow. I would be for everyone using a bow and arrow. But even with that, you could put someone out with an arrow going through their heart. I don't think I'd like that. But those are things we need probably to bring under control, but really essentially resolve the problem because a gun, a club, a knife laying there by itself does not do anyone any harm. The problem is within the heart and mind of a person who is troubled, who has been on the influence of, of the adversary, Satan, to take and to take the life of another person that they don't even know, particularly a young child. That's wrong. You don't have to be a Christian to understand that. You can be whatever you want to be and understand that is wrong. That's wrong. And so the answer, what's the answer to resolving the problem within the heart and mind? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Every person needs to be born again. Because you read in Psalm 14, you read in Romans chapter 3, without God, without the power of the Holy Spirit dealing with the heart and life, bringing about a trans transformation, it says that if we are left to our own free will, we will never, ever choose God. The nature of man, you are born in this world with a sinful nature, is not to go towards God, but to go away from God and live your life unto yourself. You cannot save yourself. You cannot save anyone else. Salvation is a gift from God. And when we, as his body, proclaims the gospel and we see him working, what will happen? A miracle takes place where a person is transformed in their soul, their mind, their will, and emotions, their spirit becomes alive unto God because prior to that, it says, your spirit is dead in sins and trespasses. You are dead. And when Jesus comes into your life, you become alive unto God. You receive eternal life. Eternal life doesn't begin when you get to heaven. Eternal life begins when you say yes to God. And our culture is not appropriate, it's not right as the world sees it for me, me to integrate into our community, into our culture, and explain to people the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is real clear. The quintessence of the gospel is this, to believe and put your faith in God that 
God Almighty on the cross died, was buried, but came out of the grave. And when we believe and say, yes, Jesus, God in the flesh, the Son of God, and that God the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit, brought him out of the grave to live forever, to give us that gift of eternal life. And so what we do, we forfeit our life and say, God, not only do I want you to be my Savior, but I want you to be the Lord of my life. Interesting, we put on our marquee out there, our sign a couple of months ago. Why is it that people here on the earth don't want to go to God's house on Sunday? But every single person who dies wants to go to his house in heaven. I can't figure that out. <laughs> I've conducted 30-some funerals last year. And people from different religions, all walks of life, all had this final conclusion that their loved one, when they died, went to heaven. doesn't matter what you believe in because their thinking is all roads lead to the same place. But Christianity is very particular. Jesus said, I am the only way, the truth and life unto God the Father. No man can come unto the Father but by me. He is the one mediator. And the reason God came into the world as we celebrate the incarnation, he didn't come to condemn it, but to save it. In God's will, it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, my will is that none should perish, but all come to repentance. Amen? Now, you're not God. I'm not God. But we are called to put our faith and trust in God, and we can sow the Word of God. We can water the Word of God, cultivate it, but we can't bring the increase. That's the miraculous thing of the power of God to change and transform a life. I wonder if those two young men who committed this ungodly atrocity in Buffalo, in Uvalde, Mexico, if they ever heard the gospel, not a bless me club, not giving the preacher a high five and say, you know, you can continue your life because God loves you and wants you to live your life the way you want to. No, it's, it's not... What it is, it's the great exchange. It's where you forfeit your life. You stop living for yourself. You give your life to God. You repent. You forgive. You begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And you die so he can live his life in and through you. Galatians 2.20. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, live by the faith of the Son of God. Amen? A miracle. And another contributing factor that is so true today in the world we live in, it's become a breeding ground for this insanity of devaluing human life and taking an assault weapon and saying to those kids in that classroom, Today, every single one of you is going to die and then begins to practice that and fulfill that. Social media, I believe, is being used by Satan to indoctrinate, radicalize the minds of people who have an inclination towards consuming all sorts of evil and ungodliness. You know, when you read the first psalm, it says to guard your eyes. Don't look upon things that are ungodly and corrupt. Don't sit in the seat of scornful. Don't participate in that. They said that young man in Conklin, New York, during the COVID, was isolated, had issues, more or less removed himself from other people, and he was indoctrinated through social media to feast upon hate and ungodliness. And that wasn't just satisfying enough in his mind to fantasize, but eventually got to the point where the 
enemy, Satan, came and said, you need to act this out. To act this out. For people who say don't believe in God, don't believe that there's an adversary, a devil, have to finally come to the conclusion their evil does exist. And if evil exists, there must be also a God who exists. And there's no such thing as Satan standing being an equal representation of goodness of God opposing each other. Satan was just a fallen, single, individual, angel. And on the cross, Jesus defeated the devil. His days are numbered. It says in the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter, that Satan, the beast, the false prophet, the trinity of evil, and all those from the beginning of time until the end of the age who have rejected Jesus Christ and the gospel. It says, and all that are confined to hell will be pulled up and all that will be cast into the lake of fire. I don't want any part of that. God, save me. I yield to you. I don't want to suffer the wrath of God. Here's the good news. As a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you will not suffer the wrath of God. Your sins, past, present, future, are under the blood, never to be resurrected and held in the courtroom of God. What we do give account for as believers at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, is we give account what we did with our life as a believer. Our time, our talents, our gifts, our resources, our life. Were you truly a follower of Jesus? Were you laying treasures up in heaven? Did your life, did you fulfill what God has ordained for you to do and called you to do? It's more than just putting an offering in a plate or attending church. That's important. But you know that God redeemed you for an eternal purpose that he has ordained. For you to fulfill and that you are serious about fulfilling that commitment unto the Lord. I believe that God is involved in the world today and what we see happening in our world. I think back when I was a young boy growing up in the 50s and living in western New York. One of my main means of transportation was not a 51 green Studebaker, but it was a bicycle. I wore out several bicycles. I went all over my hometown. I even rode the bike up in the hills and loved it when I was going down the hill. And I had faith that that wheel didn't come off. And rode all over the place. And I felt safe. My mom and dad would open the door early in the morning and say, get out of the house. And then when the sun was going down, get back in the house. I could go anywhere in that community. It wasn't a large city. I think the main population of that town was maybe 20,000 people back then. Now it's declined to 7,000. Anthony and Emily are from the great state of New York. Western New York, Niagara Falls up there. Even that community has declined in numbers. But back in those days, I never heard of a mass shooting in an elementary school. Now, there are things happening. There was, I mean, there was evil, evil and ungodly was prevalent, but not like it is today. I have never, ever seen illicit drugs. I have... I'm totally ignorant when it comes to marijuana or cocaine or methamphetamines. If I'm around it, I don't even know what the smell is like. I don't remember anyone in my high school graduating class who ever messed around with that stuff. The worst thing we ever did in elementary school was to chew a lot of gum or put a tack on the seat 
of some girl who's going to sit down. That was the worst thing we ever did. Then in high school, the worst thing we ever did in high school was not good, was the taste of beer. I remember the first time I tasted beer, I said, wow, why does anyone ever want to drink something that nasty? Ah, like drinking black coffee. I'd been sitting in the coffee urn when I was in the military in the flight line. I'd been there for two or three days. And he said, here, have a hot cup of coffee. I said, I'd rather take a bullet. I mean, my goodness. We're, we're, what's happened? We went from those days to where we are now. And I go back to my introductory statement. Our culture has become a breeding ground for the insanity that took place in Buffalo and in Texas and down through the recent history of our nation. You see, what God does when he brings judgment, I think that's happening in our nation and world today. Not trying to be negative, but just understanding. God's chosen people, Jerusalem, when they turn their back on God in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, verse 21, he says, there are four sore judgments that I will bring upon the capital of Israel. So not to annihilate them, but to bring them to a place of repentance. And he said, here's four ways that God judges. He says, war, famine, pestilence, noisome beast. War. Is there war going on now where you're seeing a lot of innocent people suffering? Yes. Particularly in Ukraine. Currently, I was reading this morning on social media. Prime Minister Zelensky of Ukraine says, world prepare for famine because we export one of the main exporters of grain in Odessa. The Russians have put a blockade to their navy, and we cannot get the grain out of Ukraine that was harvested last year. I've been to Ukraine 15, 20 times. It's the bread basket of the world. Their soil is so rich. In World War II, Hitler was using boxcars of dirt to take from Ukraine back to Germany. It's so rich. Blessed of God. The main thing they export in Ukraine is grain, corn, sunflower seed, and wheat, and other things. And they can't get it out. And the man who's in charge of the UN of food and bringing relief to areas where there is famine says we cannot get it. He says right now we're taking food from hungry people and giving it to starving people. What's happened in that part of the world is geopolitical and it will affect us. And we want to do our part. That's why we extended the garden and planted a lot more corn this year. Just not that we can feed the world, but we can help people who maybe have a need here. And say, here, we want to bless you with food. Well, the other things, but we want to give you something that's more important. We want to give you, in the name of Jesus, the Lord Christ Jesus, and give you the gift of eternal life and see that your life is turned to the right way, to God Almighty. Pestilence, COVID-19, has that affected the world? Do we see a pestilence? You bet. It has put tremendous issues and problems, and you see that that perpetuated a noisome beast, I see, as economic decline. And when the government started throwing money into the economy, what it did, it was the breeding ground, the development of a 40-year high of inflation that is still going up, meaning your dollar will purchase less than what it did a year ago. So you see those things happening. And God doesn't bring judgment to destroy the human race, but to say, God, we need you. And so that comes to my final conclusion. Here's the answer. 
We know that scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by, na- by my name will pray and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then we'll hear from God. We need right now in America a great awakening. We are due for a move of God to turn the heart of the people in this nation, in our world, to God Almighty. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about the second coming of Christ. He talks about when Christ comes back, he's not coming as a lamb, but he's coming as a lion. And what he's going to do, he's going to come and he's going to correct every wrong. He's going to deal with every form of injustice. He's going to set up his courtroom. It tells us at the second coming of Christ, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive remain shall be caught with the Lord. It's not going to be this long dispensational thing of thousands of years taking place. Many people try to interpret what the Bible talks about that one time in Revelation, a millennium. What you have to see, you cannot put time and confine God by your interpretation of what a thousand years means. You see an apocalyptical, symbolic language in the book of Revelation. Don't try to read into it to bring it up to what's happening currently. But God is relevant. He's working in our hearts and lives. And what he's saying essentially, Satan and his followers are no problem for me. I'm not going to put up a fight against God. When he comes back, real simple, he separates the sheep from the goats. And those that he knows enter into his presence. The others, there's the judgment seat of God, the great white throne judgment, and he deals with all that injustice and ungodliness. My prayer and belief is before all this happens at the consummation of the age, that there will be a great harvest because I read in my Bible, I think it's Revelation chapter 7, there was before God those in white robes. It could not be numbered from every tribe, every tongue, every nation with their hands lifted, praising and worshiping God. There are, I think, 8.5 billion people on the planet, if I recall to be correct concerning that. We need God in America. Our depraved culture is all messed up. If God doesn't come to our rescue, you can pass all the laws you want, but people who don't care People who are going to take things into their own hands and are motivated by a satanic oppression or possession will find a way to take and shed innocent blood. What the answer is, is only through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you will have mercy, that you will Have mercy on each and every one of us. God, protect us and bless us and watch over us. And pray, Lord, that you put a a stop to the atrocity that's taking place in Eastern Europe. People who have resisted God, national leaders like a Nebuchadnezzar, will be humbled and put on his hands and knees and act like an animal for seven years. And he came to a place and said, there is a God in heaven. He can take a pharaoh and snatch him out. My prayer is that people would come to repentance and turn to God. But those who resist God and stand against God and can take an archangel angel like Lucifer who rebelled against God and deal with him and then finally his ultimate demise. So I put my faith and trust in the Lord. If you would please stand to your feet.